what is a compiler or what does compilation involve right and what i mean by compilation is the process of basically transforming computer code written in one programming language into another programming language right this is sort of the most generic version of uh, what you can define as a compiler right and think about it this is actually telling you something very useful from the point of view of understanding what a compiler does right normally we think of a compiler as something that generates an executable okay yeah? but the definition does not really say that it just says it transforms computer code written in one programming language into another programming language okay yeah? and that into another programming language is an interesting thing to keep in mind so inputs to a compiler right the typical ones that we would be familiar with would be programming languages like c or java right so if you write a <clears throat> c program for example i would then use a compiler like gcc and after running through the compilation process it would generate an executable right which i could actually you know type some command and say okay execute this it will run right so all of those things you are familiar with what it means to generate an executable to run an executable and so on okay if you do the same thing with java as input it will once again generate something which is a sort of executable right why i am saying a sort of executable is that the output that a java compiler generates is not actually machine code that can directly run on a processor right it generates something called byte code for a virtual machine uh there's a question can a compiler also convert one iss instructions to other iss um well if you had a program which took input as uh you know one iss uh, uh, as instructions in one iss and uh, was trying to convert it into another uh, iss yes that would also technically fall under the category of compiler right so why am i saying that you know why am i sort of qualifying it like this because normally we wouldn't call such a thing a compiler we would probably call it a machine translation or something of that sort right but yes technically speaking in terms of what is being done it is doing exactly this right it is taking a uh, um, code written in one isa and converting it into code written in another isa okay intuitively however usually what we do is we think of going from a high level language to a low level language and what do i mean by high level language i would consider c java python etc as high level languages things that are easier for the human being to understand than for the computer versus the output will would be a low level language which would typically be for example the machine code of the x86 processor or the virtual machine byte code for the java virtual machine or interestingly this is you know where the definition of compiler becomes uh, interesting because i could just as well take a hardware description language as an input and generate a gate level netlist as an output okay now a gate level netlist is not something that we normally think of as a programming language right but if you think about it all that a gate level netlist is doing is it's basically realizing a set of boolean equations and also providing the ability to store data by means of flip flops right and in terms of what can be accomplished by using those boolean equations and the storage it is exactly the same in terms of the total amount of computability as what can be done with any other programming language okay now that's not something i can prove uh, easily in class but you know there is this concept of turing completeness which basically says that anything that can be expressed in one turing complete language can also be done in another turing complete language okay so these are uh, so that is the sense in which we can call a gate level netlist also as in some ways a programming language right and that makes it interesting for hardware designers because it basically says that two things one is i can take hardware description language and convert it into a gate level netlist the other is that it says that i can also possibly think of taking a language like c or java or python and converting that into a gate level netlist right because at the end of the day that is also a conversion from one language to another okay now if i just look at the process of compiling right what i would usually have is i would have some kind of source code right which would be 
some program written in you know uh, you use a text editor maybe uh, emacs or vi or uh, visual studio code or you know hopefully not notepad but you know anything else you use in order to write your source code once you have that you put it through the compiler right the most common compiler for uh, c language at least would be gcc right which is probably ubiquitous available almost everywhere what does it do it generates something called a .o file right so what are these .o files if you go and examine a .o file that is generated by a compiler right you will see that it basically corresponds to object code right so this is something that we would call object code that is why it has that suffix .o right and what is object code doing it's basically saying that it is effectively the machine instructions of the processor right now there is also something else in between called assembly language right now assembly language is technically speaking somewhere in between the c program and the machine code right it is one step higher than the machine code it is close enough to the machine code that you can probably get a one to one correspondence between assembly language instructions and machine code but keep that in mind because that assembly language by itself is not what a processor works on right there you still need to go through that extra step of taking the assembly language instructions and converting them into the actual machine code which will be you know 32 bit or 64 bit values which are packed one after the other somewhere in the instruction memory of the processor okay so a dot o file is basically object code which it is fairly straightforward to visualize it as assembly language instructions right so you can easily sort of uh, use the obj dump command or something and see what kind of assembly language instructions a dot o file corresponds to right now after that what is usually done especially for any non trivial program would be that i would take i would break up the overall program into multiple different source files right and sort of break them up such that i have many different object files which i compile right individually okay and then use something which is called a linker right so this command ld that i have written over there right is the name that's usually given given to something called a linker and loader right so what the linker slash loader does is it basically takes these multiple different object files and puts them together into a format which can be loaded into memory and you know whatever operating system whatever actual execution of the code that you want to do the underlying system knows how to sort of put it into memory properly and then start executing the instructions okay so if all that you are doing is writing one program which needs to run on let's say a microcontroller and there is nothing else that is going to run on the microcontroller at any given point in time that linker slash loader will be a very simple piece of software it just has to take whatever was the object code that you generated by compiling and you know dump it into memory somewhere okay but if you are running under an operating system that linker loader becomes a much more complicated thing it has to sort of interface with the operating system and put things into a way that the os can also understand properly okay finally what gets generated is something called an it's usually called an elf file an elf file right which stands for i think extensible linker format or something like that but the bottom line is as far as we are concerned that is what we usually understand as an executable okay so the whole process of compilation when you are targeting a computer right let's say i am writing some code on linux and i want to execute it over here it would end up generating an elf file which is basically a executable binary okay so that compilation process right has a number of steps in it the very first step is something called lexical analysis and parsing right lexical analysis basically says that i am going to take this c program that you generated and scan through it from beginning to end right because when i see a c program i immediately i am looking in terms of oh this was a hash include then i have oh you know this is int main this is where the main function is starting then i have a few variables being declared right the human being understands it easily 
but as far as the compiler is concerned all that it is saying is it is saying a string of bytes okay so there is one byte corresponding to the ascii character for a hash there is another byte corresponding to i there is another byte corresponding to n and so on lexical analysis basically says that it will now read that entire you know it will read all those bytes one by one until they make sense so it will take that entire hash include and convert that into a new token which tells the next program that or the next function that oh this entire thing was a hash include treat it as an include directive okay parsing is related it basically says that you know you have now got all of these tokens do the tokens make sense to the number of opening and closing parenthesis match up inside a for loop have i actually given the initialization the increment and the exit condition check properly right all of those things are what parsing essentially corresponds to okay so once i have done this lexical analysis and parsing what ends up happening is that i create something called an intermediate representation okay now what exactly is this intermediate representation well first of all it is not unique right every compiler will typically have its own concept of what is an intermediate representation right and the other thing is depending on the language that you are dealing with and the output that you want to generate you might have different variants of the intermediate representation okay at some point we'll try and see if we can look at examples of what of possible intermediate representations right but the uh, sort of useful thing to keep in mind is that you know the intermediate representation once again typically tries to capture dependencies that are there between the different functions right and how do you capture and represent dependencies nicely one good way is usually some kind of a graph right so very often you will find that the intermediate representations also have some kind of graph like qualities you have different elements in the intermediate representation and those elements are connected by edges which show what depends on what okay now the useful thing about the intermediate representation is that in some ways this is language neutral it depends only on the compiler right and this is where the magic happens right the fact that i could take either c or java as input or python or uh, verilog right all of them as long as i can take my lexical analysis and parsing and do it in such a way that it will generate an intermediate representation that is suitable for a given compiler right from there onwards it doesn't really matter what was the input language okay now in practice what ends up happening is that you know it's not as simple as that there are every compiler will have some aspect to its intermediate representation which is specific to the language that it is designed for okay so what will end up happening is that a c compiler will do very well on compiling c code but if i try taking verilog code and converting it into that same intermediate representation i'll find that there are some things in the verilog language which cannot be represented properly in the c compiler right in particular concept of time and so on okay so even though this idea of intermediate representation sounds very nice it basically says that you know any language can be the input and this intermediate representation is sort of a neutral format across all of those in practice it's not really doesn't work as well as that okay now what do i do with this intermediate representation that's where this whole idea of optimization comes in right and optimization basically says that once again you know it's like looking at some language some representation of a language and saying can i modify this in some way such that this graph or you know it's like a series of transformations on graphs so all of this pipelining parallelism that we talked about in terms of hardware something similar although not equivalent step by step right some similar kind of concepts could be done on intermediate representations in order to modify the intermediate representation and make it more suitable for the next step right usually this optimization is done in multiple passes what i mean by that is you will go through your entire intermediate representation try to make some changes to it once again go back analyze it to see what the performance looks like once again run through it and try some more changes right it's an iterative process to do this again and again 
and the last stage after this is what's called output code generation right and the output code generation basically says that i will now generate machine code for my target right so if my compiler output target is an x86 processor then i will need to generate machine code for x86 on the other hand if my target is to generate hardware right then maybe i'll try and generate directly small you know whatever appropriate units of hardware are required in order to achieve the uh, computations that i want so for example if there was a the intermediate representation had something that needs to add two values together on the x86 instruction set it would basically translate into an assembly language instruction for add but in hardware it might actually correspond to you know putting an adder and saying that these are the inputs for the adder okay now going back to the question that was asked a bit earlier right there is also this concept of a transpiler which basically converts directly from one language to another right without really trying to do many optimizations so the reason why it's called a transpiler is so it's sort of a translating compiler right because converting from one language to another in general is called translation right whereas compilation has usually got a slightly more specific meaning right it sort of says from a higher in it sort of intuitively at least says from a higher level language to a lower level language right one which is closer to a implementation a transpiler tries to convert from one language let's say c to another language like java which could be at the same level of complexity or from c to verilog right so we want to hls what is it actually trying to do it's trying to convert from c c++ to verilog okay should it be called a transpiler should it be called a compiler should it be called a high level synthesis tool beyond the point it doesn't really matter what you call it as long as you understand what it's trying to do okay now optimization what exactly does optimization itself involve right the first thing that we need to do is what are the cost metrics for which we are trying to optimize okay and if our target is software then the main thing that we would be trying to optimize would be the size of the resulting code or the execution time the amount of time taken to run right number of clock cycles okay so usually we would say i want the code to run faster so sure you go and you know look for bottlenecks in the code what is it that is taking a lot of time right and optimization hopefully would try and do this automatically right finding those bottlenecks and improving them if your target on the other hand was hardware you might have different kinds of metrics right your metric in that case might be the number of gates because i don't really have a concept of code or memory that's being generated i actually have physical gates that are being generated similarly rather than saying the overall execution time and the number of clock cycles i might directly be interested in what is the critical path which in turn determines my clock period okay most of this optimization is done as some kind of graph manipulation right so we treat the intermediate representation that is ir as some kind of a graph and we are making some kind of graph transformations that do not fundamentally change the behavior what do i mean by do not change the behavior what we are saying is that the graph transformation has to be by definition right or by construction something which cannot uh change the logic of what i am trying to do it should never for example take a multiplication and replace it by an addition right or rather actually that was a bad example to give because there are cases where you might want to replace multiplications by additions but it should not for example take a multiplication by one constant uh value c1 and change that fundamentally to multiplication by another constant c2 right typically those are not done okay those are not permitted the idea is that as long as i can come up with a set of transformations that i know will not change the behavior of my system i can apply those transformations and know that the result is always going to be the final if i run this system or i make it execute all its operations it will do exactly what it was originally doing okay and the whole idea is that i can automate this process right there should be no understanding involved in other words i really don't want the compiler to even think in terms of okay is this a multiplication is this a dot product 
you know is this some kind of uh, machine learning application which is being done and therefore i can you know use this kind of optimization no compilers typically are just blindly making changes on the intermediate representation without really caring about the type of functionality that is underlying okay the only thing that a compiler needs to do is that it should be in some way able to quantify the impact of each optimization choice right so any time i want to potentially make one choice uh, whether to make this change or not in the intermediate representation there should be some way of saying is this likely to help or hurt will it make my, pro my program bigger will it make my program faster right or is there any other metric that gets positively or negatively affected as a result of this choice okay there are a few general guidelines that we are typically followed when you want to do uh, optimization right one of them is i mean most of these are just common sense right but uh, there can be cases where you know common sense can actually lead you in the wrong direction so one of the most important guidelines for optimization in general is of course optimize the common case okay in fact this is like such a uh, important rule that there is also something you know a related principle called amdahl's law right which of course was brought up in a different context it was brought up in the context of actually optimizing processor design itself right what amdahl's law says is that if you have a code right it takes let's say some t amount of time right so this is t out of that let's say this part t1 corresponds to one set of functions right ideally of course just by looking at this you would say that you know if you can figure out some optimization that would reduce t1 then you will benefit overall right the point is how much should you try and reduce t1 right because what this is also saying is there are these other parts over here which are not part of t1 which even if i manage to shrink t1 down completely to zero or as close to zero as possible right this is still remaining and will become your ultimate determinant of how much speed up you can get okay now that of course is it's effectively telling you in other words how much you should try and optimize beyond the point if you find that you know the code that you uh, the particular part that you thought was the bottleneck if you have managed to bring that down significantly to the point where there are other parts of the code that are taking up more time then you should stop optimizing that and look at others okay now of course optimize the common case is related to this all that it's saying is you know if you are finding some function which is being called repeatedly go look at that and see how to improve it right other general guidelines in terms of optimization would be avoid redundancy right if you have like code which just says the same instruction like several times you might find that uh, you know the code becomes larger and presumably also slower having said that the reason why i have marked exceptions over there is because we will look at examples like function inlining and uh, loop unrolling where you are explicitly going to introduce redundancy in some ways to make your code run faster right similarly the next line as well less code is better intuitively that seems obvious but you will see examples where increasing the amount of code might actually make it better or run faster at least it, it won't reduce the size of the code obviously but it will make the code run faster right the other thing that you need to be aware of is i have written memory awareness but in general you need to be aware of your target right what kind of hardware what kind of system are you targeting and based on that you can then decide you know things like for example are you using dram are you using sram are there specific things that you need to keep in mind over there and how do you optimize right can you make use of things like parallelism either at the instruction level or at the task level right what are the different things that you can bring to the picture and use that in order to guide your optimization and of course the most important thing to keep in mind from an actual practical point of view is that 
a very useful way of looking at optimization is that you actually need to profile your code right rather than just looking at the code and sort of saying oh you know this looks big or this looks small you actually run it see where the bottlenecks are and then figure out what are the things to optimize like i said these are general common sense guidelines right but what we will be looking at next is actual examples of the kinds of optimizations kinds of transformations that you can apply to code in order to improve its performance